So I'm Rox Anderson. I'm the director of the Wellman Center, which is the world's largest laboratory that's dedicated to everything about light, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We take optical technologies, and we make uh, treatments and diagnostics out of them, and we figure out how light causes cancer and so forth. But having said that, that's just the theme of the Wellman Center. We're actually quite, we're really just a, a problem-solving large machine, 300 scientists almost um, spread over. Uh, <clears throat> the, the only lie about the Wellman Center is I don't know where the center is. We have, uh, uh, I think, nine different floors in six different buildings in three different cities. That's, that's Wellman Center. It's a very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary disciplinary place. And for today, I was asked to, to talk not so much about a specific technology, um, but sort of how we do it. What's the strategy? Uh, because Wellman has been fairly successful over the years in coming up with things. And having said that, I, I don't want to give the impression that we're experts. Um, we have a lot to learn, and I appreciate the fact that you have come here with your own expertise and, and uh, uh, view of things. Uh, so we'll have three talks uh, over 30 minutes. And then 30 minutes of open Q&A, which I hope is exciting and useful somehow. Um, I will introduce our other speakers. Lilith Garibian, MD, PhD, is a dermatologist like myself. I'm a pediatric dermatologist, by the way. But you'll see in a minute that you know, I don't stay put. Uh, <laughs> and Connor Evans, who's a chemist at the Wellman Center, one of the brightest people I know. So let's just get started. Um, we are different than most academic labs, and that's on purpose. Mass General Hospital, about uh, almost 20 years ago, took a look at itself and said that there's too many silos. The departments isolate people from one another, and we need some thematic centers that just bridge across. So we became one of five thematic centers at Mass General. And uh, here's our not-so-secret sauce. Um, we actually believe in our mission, which is to help people. Now, that sounds like a real simple statement, but it's actually not. We don't work for Mass General. We don't work for companies. We don't work for money. We work for patients. And I think I'm, I'm proud to say if you stop anybody in our center and ask them why they work there, they'll say, because I want to help people. It, it's, it's that simple. Um, we live in an awesome environment where we can interact with people. We're very problem driven. Um, and Living in Mass General gives us a problem-rich environment. So we, I try very hard to make sure our science is connected to the clinical reality around us, which is at sometimes actually kind of you know, uh, daunting. Um, we're big. We're intellectually diverse. Um, that little word secure is part of my job. Just keep the lights on. Um, research faculty are not willing to take big risks if they feel insecure. That's kind of what leads to what I call incremental science. You work for your, your next R01, uh, but it all within sort of some same area. We like risk taking, and it's kind of a fun sandbox. So although our depth is in optics, uh, it's important not to stay there. So you'll hear, for example, from our two other speakers about some awesome projects that are kind of uh, not necessarily any light in them. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't need to read my slides here. We're a high energy place, basically. Scientists, physicians, engineers, facilitators, strategists. And if you want a job, please come talk to me after the, <laughs> the session. And then the last part is working with industry. Our mission of actually helping people cannot be accomplished in an academic setting only. Um, the, you know, Mass General and Harvard Medical School are the, those products are really education and healthcare. We don't make devices or drugs or software. So, in order to actually help people, we love working with industry. This next slide is a uh, and then stir well and often, right? <laughs> Just the uh, uh, interactions that happen there. By the way. It's okay to interrupt. I'm supposed to be only 10 minutes long here. I'm a professor, which when you break that word down, it just means somebody who talks a lot, so you have to be careful. Um, this is uh, kind of a cycle of what happens over and over again at Wellman Center, which is you start with a problem worth solving. 
We typically don't start with a technology, although sometimes we can with a new technology. But the secret sauce here is really staying in touch with a problem that's worth solving. And then you go through this cycle, you brainstorm, come up with more than one potential solution. And that's key, because typically things don't work the way you predict them to go. Show feasibility, get intellectual property, make prototypes, uh, do preclinical studies. You're, you're, I think most people are familiar with that. And then once you really get into the seriousness of, of having winnowed that down, now, now you've got one or two strategies where you might have started with six um, to solve the problem and do clinical trials and working with industry. Um, the place that our problems come from is humanity. Just, <laughs> I, I've taught a course at MIT where we, would, and I see one of my former students sitting here. Hi, Samir, raise your hand. This is Samir. <laughs> uh, this course was basically having students look at problems freshly in the hospital, walk around and say, well, what do you see that bothers you? And uh, we, set, in essence, do that uh, all the time. Um, and then you, it takes money. Uh, the hardest funds to get are the ones where your crazy ideas just still sound crazy and um, NIH doesn't typically want to fund that. So we recycle our royalty money into doing that. We also work a lot with Department of Defense, which seems to be more tolerant than NIH for that early stage. Um, we Filing IP, which is really important, um, is an interesting process where we get to work with the hospital itself and um, uh, ask them to spend their precious money on our wacky ideas, which actually sometimes works. Um, as you go around, you need more OPM, other people's money. <laughs> and it comes from different places, uh, NIH uh, funding, uh, some philanthropy and so forth. But increasingly toward the end, it's just a lot of interaction with industry. And we love that contact sport. At the end of the day, if you hit the nail on the head, you solve the problems and, and people are happy. And then you get to you know, really test it out. When, when the things come out and they're actually in medical use is where the rubber meets the road. And I think we have an unfair advantage by living in a hospital. We understand the ecosystem of medical care because we're in it. Um, and by the way, we only succeed half the time. I took a look at the retrospectively um, families of patents where we decided, oh, this is worth you know, putting ourselves into. And indeed, uh, uh, it's only about a half, some, somewhere around that, that you get all the way through the cycle and come up with something worthwhile, which isn't bad, but I know we can be better, um, and it takes years to do it. So uh, on this slide, which I will not read, is our, our 20 examples of things that are in clinical practice today that rolled out of Wellman Center in sort of that cycle. Some are drugs, some are devices, uh, most, most of them are novel therapeutic uh, strategies in some way. Um, we've got a pretty good track record looking back. Now, um, on the right-hand side of that slide, I put little asterisks by the technologies where we had good IP have, have a black asterisk. And the technologies where we somehow, for, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, by the way, and we have to own uh, some of it. It's very easy to sort of you get involved in this, and then the project takes on a life of itself. And at the end of the day, you may not have good uh, patents. The point of that is that actually solving the problems and helping people is sometimes independent of the classic uh, presence of good IP. And I put these in chronological order from the top to the bottom. I'm proud to tell you that the, the number of black, black asterisks increases <laughs> with time. We've gotten better at working uh, with IP. Um, so another way of looking at this is that Wellman Center takes problems worth solving, puts them into a pipeline, and then of course the output is in part uh, uh, related to the regulatory process, tech transfer, um, at, at the advanced development. And um, we, as scientists, we try very hard to stay involved all the way to the bitter end and, in fact, participate in the 
clinical adoption of what we've created. So there's this, uh, I actually don't like the word tech transfer. It's really fraught with risk to transfer things. So if you are the experts, you know, stay involved, let the team grow, but don't give it away. So I thought I would just end on what, what are some of the things in our pipeline. We're not here today to pitch anything. Uh, I really want this to be a conversation of how uh, people develop things. You're gonna hear from Lilith and Connor of what excites them. Um, but these are just some of the things that are in our pipeline. We have a whole program to keep you from bleeding to death. That's because the DOD has funded us for a while. Um, a universal flu vaccine. Uh, you heard of some of that this morning, actually, that if you uh, initiate a, a T cell response as opposed to humoral immunity, you get long-lasting cell-mediated immunity, which is really the way that the body defends itself against viruses. So. Um, <clears throat> I, I, for one, as I get older, would love to have only one flu shot and be done with it. Uh, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> detecting shock. Shock is the number one um, preventable cause of death at Mass General, where, where the death is unexpected. The mortality of shock is 10% per hour. And so we're very interested in, uh, among the thousands of people at Mass General Hospital, detecting who is slipping into shock. It's not easy to do clinically, but we have some ideas of that. Um, and then I'll, blocking scarring uh, for neurofibromatosis, the number one human disease associated with a single gene. That's the neurofibroma gene. We have some new strategies to help those kids um, and, and so forth. So I'm, I'm out of time. I'm going to, inter I'm going to end here um, and uh, introduce um, Lilith Garibian, my dear colleague. Lilith, while you're coming up here, Lilith's an amazing person. Uh, she's uh, uh, early in her life a refugee from Armenia and uh, went over there and established children's clinics. Uh, and it's, it's been a great pleasure of uh, not only working with you in the lab and the clinic, but helping the world. My intro to her, one of my slides earlier said, pay attention to mother nature. Um, so I'm a pediatric dermatologist. There's this oddball thing that happens. Little children are, uh, if you put anything in their mouth, they suck on it. They're just programmed to do that. Um, and years ago, uh, parents putting popsicles in a newborn infant's mouth, uh, uh, the kids will get this inflam inflammation of their fat in their cheeks. And in a single paper uh, was published on this, 1970, in the New England Journal of Medicine called Popsicle Paniculitis. And it was that hint that led us to start looking at cold as a therapeutic strategy to remove fat from the body. And uh, Lilith, this is your intro, so please come up. Dr. Garibian, uh, thank, thank you. you. This is your clicker. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much, um, and thank you to the organizers and ROCS for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, as he said, I'm an associate professor at Harvard Medical School in dermatology. I'm a physician scientist innovator at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine, and um, I have over 16 provisional and some granted patents, and um, I'm funded by NIH and DOD to do some of the work I'm gonna talk about, which has led to formation of three VC-backed startup companies, which is really exciting, and I co-founded two of them. So um, thanks again. And I will start by talking about this technology, which Rox just introduced, which is based on this concept that um, so fat uh, lipid-rich tissue, which are fat cells, are susceptible to cold injury. So this became a very successful um, product which has been used in clinics over millions of treatments have been done. It's called cool sculpting. And um, one of the most common but unintended yet fully reversible side effect from this technology was a long lasting loss of sensation in the treated area. Um, this was a side effect seen by hundreds of doctors who treated these patients, but I got really interested in it. I became very curious because I wanted to sort of understand um, 
what is causing this with the intent of trying to use that understanding to develop a novel treatment for pain and itch, which I knew as a practicing dermatologist, majority of our patients suffered from. So in Wellman, one of the unique things that we do, actually there's three unique things. Um, let me summarize those three bullet points and then I'll continue. Um, that I think from my perspective promotes uh, successful innovation is number one, we really foster curiosity with the intent of solving an unmet medical need. And this is one example of that. I was very curious about this and when I went to Rocks with this idea, he supported it because he had the foresight to really see how understanding the side effect um, can then help us solve an unmet clinical need and the impact that that would have in helping so many patients who suffer from pain and age symptoms in dermatology. So he supported me um, and this led to invention and development of a different cooling technology, uh, which is injectable cooling technology. Um, and this allows us to target lipid rich tissue. And when I say lipid rich tissue, I'm referring specifically to myelin sheets around the nerves, which wrap the nerve to insulate and allow the nerves to transmit signals, and also fat tissue, which, as you know, is present in the human body. With this injectable cooling technology, we could target um, those uh, lipid-rich tissues anywhere within the human body that's accessible with the needle. And this led uh, to development of an invention that we call um, cryoslurry platform technology. If you think about it, um, it allowed the creation of a whole new therapeutics because it allowed us to target those tissue in a way that we could help prevent or treat diseases or pain. Um, and for the first time ever, it allowed the creation of a pain-free, drug-free, injectable cooling technology that we could use to target lipid rich tissue with the focus of trying to treat a disease. Um, and as you could see, I'm showing some of the applications that this could potentially be used for. Um, uh, for example, we could use it to target the fat at the base of the tongue to treat obstructive sleep apnea, because patients with obstructive sleep apnea have large fat deposits there. We could use it to treat visceral fat, which has caused disease in humans. Uh, for example, pericardial fat is known to be associated with cardiovascular disease. Um, and we could use it to target myelin sheets and treat pain, which I will get back to um, later on my slides. So this is an amazing technology, and this is only the tip of the iceberg of what exactly is possible with this injectable, and we are open to um, pursuing other indications. Now, actually, let me go back to that. The second point that I wanted to make that makes Wellman successful in innovating is that we actually create multidisciplinary teams to continue to innovate. What do I mean by that? Well, the past 10 years, I've been working on designing and executing proof of concept studies, animal studies, to show the value of this platform technology for multiple of those indications. And I couldn't have done that alone. I mean, we have a team, uh, and also we needed to work with, patient, uh, with uh, experts who have the resources, the tools, and know-how to help us execute those proof of concept studies. So at Wellman, we're really encouraged and we're supported to go and seek out those people and bring those experts in and those experts help us not only in developing uh, the science to add value to our technology, but we also bring clinicians who give us a lot of input um, as an end user, how they see this technology fitting into the clinic, which is very important. I mean, early on, you kind of want to develop the product in a way that you know is going to be easily adapted in clinic and used by the clinicians for whom you're solving this. So let me give you a brief example of that for targeting the tongue fat. We worked very closely with an ENT surgeon from 
Walter Reed, um, who not only worked with us collaboratively and helped us with some of the animal work, but he also, as an ENT doctor who will be using this technology, told us how to think about the development of this. How would this fit into his clinic? Should it be an OR treatment? Should it be an in-office-based treatment? Those are all critical information that help make the invention successful. Now, the third point that I want to get to is that we also form, um, we actually partner with industry to continue the development of our technology in order to bring that to our patients. So that's another unique aspect um, of working at the Wellman Center. So either that's in a form of starting a new company, a startup company, or working with pre-existing companies. We interact closely with uh, our industry partners to continue shepherding our work to the patients. And that, I think, is very critical because nobody knows the technology, the science, and the work better than the actual inventors of that technology. So having that close interaction is really important. And we've done this well for um, this technology uh, for the pain indication. So we co-founded a startup company uh, which is pursuing uh, the use of this cryo slurry to block pain. Um, and by working with them closely, we were able to sort of discuss and understand, okay, what indication should we use this for? And the first one, we selected it to be pain because millions of Americans suffer from pain, which has led to a lot of patients start to use opioids that they're addicted to now. So there's an urgent unmet need of developing a better therapy for pain. I mean, the current treatments for pain, besides opioids, as you might know already, there's injectable anesthetic blocks, which work really well, um, but they're very short lasting. Like the longest block lasts for 24 to 72 hours. But our cryo slurry platform would allow us to inject this for pain control and block pain for months at a time. So think of this as a local anesthetic. It's very easy to inject, just like you would inject a local anesthetic with a standard needle and syringe, but you could block pain for months at a time. So this is really going to be the first injectable um, that could um, allow patients have a long-lasting relief from pain. And the first initial safety and efficacy studies in humans are very promising. We're very excited about the results. And, um, developing and bringing this further to patients. Um, as you know, this is a big market. Uh, pain management uh, has a lot of acute and chronic pain. For knee specifically, uh, one could target the osteoarthritis pain or preventing post-knee replacement pain. And those are areas that we want to take this technology to. So, with that, I'm just going to end summarizing what I think are the three unique aspects of the Wellman Center that make innovation successful. As I said, number one, we support curiosity with the intent of solving an unmet medical need. Number two, we create and promote working with multidisciplinary teams to work on solving and creating um, a solution to that unmet need. And number three, we really partner and work closely with our industry partners to continue the development of the technology. Thank you. And with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Connor Evans. Great. Well, thanks. So um, I'm Connor Evans. Um, I lead a research team at uh, Mass General Hospital. We're about 15 or so people large, and it's very interdisciplinary, and you'll see why in a sec. But um, what I want to talk about today is a, is a, a very interesting story. We're not all the way to, uh, to product yet, but I think it illustrates some of the things that Wellman does well and uh, where people kind of come in and out um, to the picture, and that's specifically to look at um, the sensing of oxygen uh, within tissue. So um, the, what, what's the key problem? And, 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 and as, as 
folks in this audience probably know well, it, defining the problem we're solving is, is sometimes 80% of the work. Um, if, you, if you get started with the wrong problem or you get with the wrong definition, um, you can go down alleyways and get lost. The, the problem here is, is oxygen. Um, you've all been to the doctor, you've, they put a pulse ox on your finger. Um, that's measuring the oxygen in your blood and how much oxygen is loaded in your blood. But what you really want to know is how much oxygen is in your tissue because the cells in your body need oxygen to survive. It's a, it's a metabolite and if cells don't receive oxygen, they will die. The problem is oxygen is colorless, it's odorless, you can't see it, it diffuses really quickly and it's actually hard to detect. It sounds simple, right, that something as, as easy as oxygen, you should be able to see where it goes, you should be able to see where it is in the tissue, but in fact it's not and it's actually quite challenging. Um, and, if you, um, and if you look, and this is a slide that I borrowed from one of our attendees, Songshi made this in the back. Um, if you look, many of the things that we do in the clinic are trying to get at how much oxygen is in tissue, but they do a very bad job of it. So we have all these tools that measure perfusion. Perfusion is an indirect measurement. Is there blood getting to the tissue? And we have all these tools, we have Doppler, we have the, the Novadac spy is an injectable thing where you look where how the fluorescence in the body to see whether blood's getting somewhere. And we roll people in MRIs to see if blood is actually getting into place. Um, there are other tools that measure how much oxygen is loaded onto heme. This is hemoglobin. Um, and this is uh, 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 STO2 devices. Um, there are NEARS devices, there are these imaging tools, there's the pulse ox. But again, this is how much is in the blood, not how much is in the tissue. Um, to get to PO2, that is the, the concentration of oxygen, this is a challenge. Um, there, there are these devices that are used in our wound care clinics. They're called TCPO2 devices. Um, they, they do measure oxygenation, but it's ancient technology. Doctors hate using it. They largely sit on the shelf in the back. Um, they take about 30 minutes of bedside calibration. They're, they're a mess. And then there are these research grade tools, but they're not in the clinic yet. And so the real question came about of, of, of can we do better? Can, can we actually measure what's going on? And, and the way this project started um, was my team was very interested in looking at oxygenation in cancer because hypoxia and loss of, lack of oxygenation is a problem when you're trying to treat cancer. And so I, we had been working on some tools like this in rocks um, and, um, and another physician at the Wellman, Lynn Drake, dragged me down a little bit kicking and screaming because I didn't, I said, oh, I don't know about, I don't know what to do. They took me down to the Center for the Intrepid um, uh, down in Texas. And this is a place where um, um, soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan were coming back and were um, basically having these heroic surgeries done on them where they were rebuilding hands and feet, uh, new, you know, borrowing Peter to pay Paul, right, different parts of the body and, and, and go undergoing, you know, burn therapies. And I had a chance to walk around and actually meet not just these soldiers, but the doctors, these heroes who are putting the heroes back together. Um, and rather sheepishly, a couple hours later, we were supposed to give a little talk on what we did. And so I'm sitting down making this little talk about, hey, I like, I like to measure oxygen. And sitting next to me was a clinician I had met that morning who was putting together what he, a talk on what he needed. And his slide said, I need to see oxygen. And my slide was saying, we can see oxygen. The two of us looked at each other and that was the problem. That was when the connection was made. It was directly between a scientist and a clinician. And we got started with this and we pulled in a lot of people. I got back to my team. I said, okay, stop the presses. We're, stop we're not doing this research anymore. We're doing this. We're gonna get this out to patients. We're gonna get this out to soldiers. And we did this proof of concept and, and actually um, Zhongxi in the back took this image. Um, this is in a burn um, where we mapped for the first time the oxygenation in the tissue with a camera. Um, and this was really exciting. Um, and so we showed this to a whole bunch of clinicians and they said, well, this is great, but how do you do it? He says, well, first of all, you have to turn the lights off. And then you tend to stuff things under the door so the lights don't come in from outside because the, the imaging tool we're using is so dim and you need this cryogenically cooled CCD camera and, and no, it's time out. The clinician said, no, this is not what we need. Um, and we started to kind of look at what had to happen in order to make this possible. And this is when Gabriella Apu, our director for translational research at the Wellman Center got involved. And to start, so we, we started going out to clinicians. So um, Zhongxi and me and a couple of people in the team started like literally stomping around um, to plastic surgeons and surgeons in Boston. What do you need? What it would look like? What's the regulatory piece look like? Gabriella brought in um, surgeons from the United States, from, um, from Europe, and we had meetings on basically how we could develop this technology. And what came out of it was really a targeted development approach that said, this is the problem, 
this is what we need. And we even brought in folks on the mass general innovation side, the tech side, saying, what do we need in terms of IP? What do we need to protect this? And so it, a very holistic approach to this, um, which is tough because as an academic, I knew how to do none of this, right? I can, write, I can make the molecule and write the paper, but we had to make the molecule, make the device, get it to clinicians, do the clinical study, write the IP. I mean, this was, this was firing on all cylinders, but it was really exciting. And what we ended up doing was creating from this necessity, um, this really neat molecule. And it, it's, on, it's on the left, but we, what it's doing is on the right. And it's this neat little molecule that glows in response to oxygen. And so um, if you shine a little bit of light on it, it will glow red. And the more oxygen there is, the dimmer it gets. The less oxygen there is, the brighter it gets. So it detects low oxygen. And if you pair it with something like a green dye, you can actually see oxygen with your eyes. If this is um, taken with an iPhone, and um, this is illuminated with a, a cheap LED pen light I bought at a gas station. The six months prior to this, um, we had to turn all the lights off in the room and use a cryogenically cooled CCD camera that cost $80,000. And now we can do it with your eyes. And so that, it, but it was that synthesis of here's the problem, this is the solution necessary that made it very clear what we had to do as an interdisciplinary team. And I'll just, I'll just finish up quickly with this. We've now taken this into a number of places. Um, we've made bandages that you can spray on and um, put on and actually look with your eyes or with a camera and look at oxygenation across wounds. Um, we've made wearable sensors. So we've slapped this on people and had them do exercises and we can actually monitor the oxygenation in their body and in their muscles as they're actually moving and doing exercise. Um, and we're now integrating these into wounds, things like negative pressure wound therapy dressings, so that we can see what's going on under the hood, under the bandage, um, and be able to monitor things like wound healing. I'll finish up by mentioning one thing, and that's, that's the importance of, of close collaborations. And while a lot of things that go on at Wellman are with startups, this technology ended up being partnered, um, and we've had now um, for, for more, than two, more than 18 months, a partnership with, uh, with 3M. And, and there's challenges working with bigger companies. Um, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of pitfalls, and I have a lot of horror stories working with big companies. This has not been. Um, and I think one of the reasons why was that very, very early on, we figured out, um, Gabriella and myself, and we figured out that we had to put together a stellar team on our side and on 3M. And this has been a huge piece to, um, to both enable the scientists at 3M to be able to take on the challenges and, and to internalize this technology, but to really make this, we meet, we've met for 20 months now, every week for an hour and a half. Every week we get together. Every week we're talking about progress. Every week we're transferring. And when, in the beginning, um, I was doing a lot of talking. And these days I do a lot of listening. And that's perfect. Because it, and we help, help with targeted problem solving. But it really has been a really, interesting process of building a solid team that can do tech transfer. Um, and this collaborative process has led to all kinds of new technologies that 3M has built on their side, new intellectual property, um, and I think a lot of new opportunities that we're really excited to. So I'll, I'll finish up with that, but I think this, this project has really been a Wellman project. It was conceived at Wellman, it came from a, pr a problem, it was translated with Wellman expertise, um, and hopefully soon, It'll be something that we can bring to patients. So thank you so much. I'll, I'll give you this. Oh, thanks. Yeah, because so as, as there you have it. Um, so listen, the next half hour, I'm just the MC. I don't have a plan, um, a little bit of a plan, but not, not much. And I, what I'd love to do is just uh, as you eat your sandwiches here, to ruin your lunch with having lots of <laughs> provocative questions. And um, what you just heard was, from my point of view, the first thing that gives you long acting nerve block. Okay? The first thing that can give you a long acting nerve block. And the first time that you can see oxygen with your eyes in the body or with a cell phone. Um, and I think both of those stories illustrate kind of you, the value of a, of a important task, all right, medically, technologically, but also getting it down to something simple. 
Lilith just described to you basically a daiquiri in a syringe, right? <laughs> and um, Connor just described to you this kind of magic stuff that allows you to see oxygen because he's a great chemist and can make that uh, happen. So let, before we just kick this open, I'm curious about you. And by the way, we're very interested in learning from you in the next half hour. Um, how many people here work in industry? Uh, we have a block over here. Ah, look, you have a, oh, there, there's a lone industry person over there. <laughs> um, how many people are in an academic lab setting? How about uh, regulatory? That kind of work. How about legal and IP stuff? I know you guys are just being shy. <laughs> so you, you recognize in the room the breadth of, of talent that's here. And I think we all have our unique uh, perspectives. So let, let me just kick this open. And uh, um, anybody can ask any question. I think we have some roving microphones. And um, uh, please, start. Hi, great presentations, by the way. I'm Idi Levin from the Innovation Office at MGB. So I was wondering for the oxygen sensing, is it easy to expand to other fields? I mean, the first thing I could think of was respiratory illnesses. So mm -hmm. um, I was just curious. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, yes, we think respiratory illnesses um, and anything cardiovascular, uh, we think is really important. and. Um, like we, we have a clinical study we're about to launch in peripheral artery disease um, because we know that those are scenarios where the periphery becomes deoxygenated. Um, I've always wanted to study Raynaud's phenomenon. Like I think there's something neat there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think car cardiovascular problems are, I hate the term low hanging fruit because it's never truly low hanging, but I think those are the most obvious. Um, I think there are some one thing I didn't talk about is we're now actually developing to not just do oxygen, but also carbon dioxide simultaneous, which are two sides of the same coin. So if you can do both at once, now you can start doing things like blood gases and you know, uh, non-invasive monitoring uh, for transport. And so there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in the cardiovascular space uh, as well as in the wound space. And I think those, are, those, in my mind, are the two most obvious and, and maybe the largest markets. Um, for this for this technology. Did, did you have a specific thing in mind? A problem? Uh, I thought of asthma. Asthma. Yeah. 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 So it's tough to know. I've taken care of plenty of kids with asthma in ERs, and um, we monitor them. But it would be really nice to know how well they're oxygenating. Um, it's interesting, like the, uh, to me, uh, the, Connor's technology could also be used as a, as a whole body monitoring system. Yeah. If, if, I'll just use SIDS, Sudden Infant yeah. Death Syndrome, as an example, which by the way affects um, African American children disproportionately. Mm -hmm. And then if you look around the world, one of Wellman's goals is actually to do global medicine. We're, we are literally in every continent, including Antarctica, uh, doing projects to help the world. But I, most of the SIDS monitors fail because of false alarms, you know, the, the trying to measure breathing or something. If you directly measure the oxygenation of the child, which is why they die, I think you might come up with something better. So, so many ideas like that. I'll, I'll, let me just, one of the earlier, one of the early questions that we had, and, and, and there are publications out now that talk about it, but, but the, all these STO2 devices, the pulse ox and whatnot, there have been now a slew of, of, of reports about how they don't work in people who have darkly pigmented skin. They have lots and lots of problems with that. And so one of the early things we had done with this project was to validate that it works equally well in my skin, right? I'm a Fitzpatrick type one. I'm, I, 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 <laughs> you put me, in, you put me in the sun for, one, for five minutes yeah. and I burn. <laughs> Right, yeah. but it, that works equally well on someone who's, you know, both, you know, Northern Irish and someone who's Central Congan, you know, uh, descent, and it does. We validated that it works, so that's been a big thing. And Rox keeps poking me on the SIDS bear, and I, and, and he's right. Um, <laughs> we just yeah, he's not enough hours in the day to do everything we'd like to do, but, we'll, but I think we'll SIDS is, a, is an outstanding target for this yeah. type of technology. It's also, for, kind of forgot to mention, it's inexpensive. I mean, the design criteria for anything 
has to include that end game. So, uh, you know, anyway, so my, one of my best MIT students ever <laughs> had his hand up a moment ago. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Who are you, sir? I, I'm Samir Saber. I'm the CEO of Brixton Biosciences, which is one of the companies that's worked with the Wellman to develop uh, some of their technology. But my question is really for Connor. Oh. And for Lily, one of the things that's always been so exciting about the Wellman, I think, is their willingness and excitement to engage with industry uh, to get technologies to patients. I think industry is often viewed as a necessary or sometimes even unnecessary evil, and uh, we have good intentions too. <laughs> so um, you've both taken very different paths with your technologies. You know, Connor, you worked with 3M, which is about as big as a big company uh, can get. Uh, and Lilith, you've taken the approach of working uh, with startups from the ground up. And I wonder maybe if you guys can just, you know, talk amongst yourselves for a minute about comparing and contrasting those two approaches and, and sort of identifying some of the common themes around what it takes to make uh, an approach like that successful. Because uh, I think that's something you guys do really well, whether it's big companies or small companies. I think we could all learn from that. So, yeah, sure. So, yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, I think there's pros and cons for both of those approaches. Uh, I will speak from my perspective of working with a startup, um, which I found to be really enjoyable and exciting, I think. Oops. Oh. Yeah. So what are the positive things with working with a startup? I think there's this sense of urgency, like there's do or die. You have to kind of put a nice team, a great team together, work very hard, to hit your next milestone or value creation point. You don't have to do that in a large company. So I like that sense of urgency. Um, I, so that allows people to work much more efficiently and effectively. I also like that there's not too much bureaucracy. So you don't have to get permissions from like, you know, 10 layers of people to do what you need to do tomorrow. Um, and that again makes things much more efficient from my standpoint. Um, I, so those are the two things that I've noticed in terms of what I enjoy the most about working with a startup company. So maybe Connor, you could yeah. speak. Yeah, I, I think what Lilith said ring, rings true in my mind is, is the most important thing, whether you're in a startup or in a big company, is the team. It's the people that you're bringing together to work on the problem. And, and in some, because in any kind of technology transfer, right, the technology starts at one place and has to get to another, right? The crown comes off the head and has to be passed along at all stages. And, and in, in a big company, bureaucracy is, is a killer, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've had big company collaborations where we've literally had a senior VP who just didn't get it and everything died on his desk. Um, and that was really frustrating. I think in the, our experience with 3M, it's been, we've kind of had to, I don't want to say grease the wheels in a way, but in a way, in, in order to get those approvals, I mean, I don't know how many times Gabrielle and I have gotten a plane and flown out to St. Paul and just met with people up the chain. And when, they, and when they reorged, we went out and did it again. And we just kept on meeting with those folks to, to, to give the sense of urgency, to talk about what the team has been doing, to identify, I mean, attaboys are really important, right, to, um, in, in that. But, but again, to make sure that, that there's ownership. And I think, I think in a startup, ownership is, is easier because you can see the people who own it, right? In a larger company, I think you have to sell that idea of ownership up the chain um, and make sure that that senior VP who's taking a risk by just signing his name on the bottom, money's gonna trickle down from that person. But you have to make sure that that person owns the project as much as the chemist who's helping us. Um, and that has been, I think, instrumental. Um, I will say that on a big company side of things, I think having someone like Gabriella involved, who not just is a translation, but has been on, who's been on both sides of, of, the, of the desk, who's been in industry and in academia, has really helped. And I think that, because there's no way I would have been able to do this without her. Um, and, I, and I do think that that's been tremendously important in dealing with a bigger company, is having someone who's been on that side, who understands the demands, and who can speak the language. 
Um, and, uh, Gabriella, could anywhere. you could you raise your hand? That's Gabriella. So we hired her. How long have you been working here? Over a decade. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, we hired her specifically to help us deal with translation to industry. She comes from both a, a rigorous uh, uh, scientific background and then working in respiratory gas. Um, uh, field, nitric oxide and so forth, has done a great job helping us, you know. Nobody in academia gets trained to do this stuff. So guess how we learn? By making mistakes. And uh, I'm very interested in the educational part of it. Can I answer your question, Samir? I think the kiss of death is working with a large company that is threatened by the technology. So right up front, just don't even, don't, don't even try. Um, and I've seen this happen, e even at Wellman Center. We, uh, we didn't talk about it here. We came up with a way of doing sutureless and state, you know, re uh, uh, sutureless repair of tissues using a light activated, already FDA approved uh, uh, dye. And J&J uh, &J uh, was the primary point of contact. Guess how much they make selling Band-Aids and suture? I mean, it was just a non-starter from the beginning. They killed the project. They made sure it lasted forever. Uh, <laughs> and the IP just timed out. It's still a wonderful opportunity. We, we reinvented that when we discovered sort of why it works. And we have capability now at Wellman of passivating tissues. One of the bullets on my slide there was the you can do surgery and not get a big scar. That has to do with stabilizing the collagen matrix, and, and, and which is where preformed TGF beta lives, right? So you stop the, uh, the, the surgical uh, sort of trigger to scarring starts right at the beginning. But that whole thing was, that played out, it was like literally 20 years later, we're reinventing it to make use of it because we screwed up the, the process of making a, a choice uh, of the wrong place to dock it. Um, and the other thing I, I think um, is that uh, the startup companies, what they're lacking, there's no, um, there's no machine to get it out there. Advertising, marketing, distribution, sales. Yeah. So there's some tipping point where uh, whether you start working with a large company and successfully survive their largeness or whether the, the small company has to exit in the right way, that end game is very poorly served by most startups. Having said that, when we developed the cool sculpting thing, this is fat removal by, by what amounts to a refrigerator. No new technology, right? Um, that, that was a startup company and began in my little conference room next to my office and then uh, a decade later was uh, exited or became public and was acquired for two and a half billion dollars. Single company the whole way, just grew with the project, right? So I, I think, uh, I'm sorry I'm going on and on, I warned you I'm a professor. <laughs> that, you look at any one of these projects, they're just not the same. If you've seen one yeah. project, you've seen one project. And you, the, str the strategy of how to work with industry changes. Um, we love working with industry, mostly because we learn. We're just addicted to learning. So <laughs> anyway, more questions of, of, of any? Yes. A lot of academics have a reluctance to sort of dive in with industry, even startups, um, and they, you know, want to hold on to the technology so they can write more grants and they can, you know, keep the ac academic machine kind of going. So I'm wondering, you know, how do you guys think about when the time is right to start partnering with industry, and, you know, what do you think other academics in other areas could sort of learn from you guys in terms of um, how to do this better? Well, maybe I'll, I'll take it. I, I, I'm an oddball. I think the time to start, I mean, diff different projects are different, but I, I'd like to start engaging with industry as, as early as possible. And I think, because a lot of what we do is engineering. We do chemical engineering, we do mechanical engineering, we do electrical engineering, right? If I don't know who, industry is my stakeholder, right? They're the ones who are gonna build it and make it. And, and if I don't know, if I haven't spoken to them, if I don't know the roadmap ahead of me, there are a ton of places I could go with the technology and I would go the wrong way. Um, this oxygenation is, is a great example of places where I could have taken this technology, I, we could have made a proprietary 
uh, proprietary polymer. We could have made all. We could have done all of these things, and none of that would have gotten it to industry correctly because, um, and, and I wouldn't have known that ahead of time. So, so at least having conversations early on are really important. I, um, industry also was a very early sponsor of this work and pulled us in directions that we wouldn't have gone in any other way. So I, I welcome it. Um, obviously, you, you want to have your intellectual property protected as much as possible before you, you launch with industry, but I, I have found largely only benefits from it because you learn so much. Yeah, um, so I'll take that. Also, great question. So you're absolutely right. I mean, when I was doing my MD-PhD training at Harvard, like we're, we're taught that industry is the dark and evil side and true academicians really stay away from it. Um, that has changed a lot, but for me that changed when I joined Rox's lab to do my postdoctoral training um, because I saw the value of working with the industry to successfully bring the technologies you're creating to patients. Like it's hard to do that alone as an academician and you need industry to help you um, bring whatever you've invented and created a commercial product and then bring it to patients. So if you view it from that aspect, you know, and you look at what are your common goals and focus on that, I feel like it makes you see why it's important to work with the industry. For me, like uh, with your question of when is the right time, I think having some IP protection so you know when you're having discussions with the industry your work is protected and having some solid proof of concept studies with good yeah. data that you could justify, okay, I've shown it's safe. Um, if you have efficacy data, even better. Um, but then the next step is really to go to humans. I think that's when engaging industry is the right thing to do um, because then you need to start building the prototype and then just doing that iterative process of kind of testing it in patients, getting feedback, changing it. Um, industry is better in more in the development of the technology, whereas academia is good at the research part. Um, so in my opinion, when you're ready to go into that development phase, it's a good time to engage industry. I think there's different cultures, industry, academia, and the best is when you're working, no matter which side you're on, an understanding of what, you have to sort of walk a mile in their shoes, so to speak. I've never had a real job. I've just been at Harvard my whole life, but you know, uh, that's not true. I used to mow lawns when I was a kid. Uh, but uh, you know, working with a company where they sort of respect that what you're talking about, the, the need to publish, the need to, to be intellectually free um, uh, and then issues of secrecy and timing come up but if you if you're actually in collaboration with whoever you're working with in industry then it works one of my favorite books although it's not an easy read is the Robert Sutton the no asshole rule all right um, just don't work with people that you can't work with and you get that up front things go smoothly I, yeah. I think it's more important who you work with than where they are. Yeah. Um, so so it, this is being recorded. Sorry about that word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what else? Any, any other? Yes, in the back there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hope Taft uh, from the Martino Center. And I'm just more curious from an organizational perspective as you think about prioritizing these unmet needs and you think about interacting with industry down the road, does that come into play when determining what the right unmet needs are to pursue? Because you did talk about how important it is to put the patient first, obviously, and then, but coming from industry myself, I see how that inter you know, that can come into conflict sometimes with how industry prioritizes certain investments as well. So I'm just curious at the beginning of that cycle that you had on that slide, kind of how the future steps in that cycle impact kind of that prioritization at the beginning. That's a great question. And I'm gonna turn it, don't, don't let that microphone go too far away because I'm gonna turn it back to you in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the joys we have at Wellman is actually working with Department of Defense. It's very unlike NIH. That they come to the doorstep with these problems on their sleeve and, mm -hmm. and very interested in real products and, and real impact. So one of the things we do at Wellman is try to align 
that in that wheel that I showed, the, the, between 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock in that wheel, uh, it's really important to align the funding with the problem that you're trying to solve. And, 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 and then it changes when industry get involved. But I'm putting it back to you. So I'm, you know, industry, what is that? That's like some word that describes a gigantic multinational, you know, multidisciplinary enterprise. Yeah, it's driven by money, but um, a lot of times the, the best people to work with uh, in companies, they actually are, they're, they're people who want to do well by doing good. Um, and I'm putting it back to you. What, I don't know what you do in, in uh, the industry world, but uh, I think starting with money as the motivation would be against what we typically do. On the other hand, even if you want to save the world in some horrible disease, if you can't survive to get there, it's not yes. going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's some kind of yeah. mix, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I think I'm coming from the perspective of coming from a large, I was at Medtronic previously in a great company, but I, do, I did see a lot of important R&D projects be cut because of um, financial considerations at the end of the day. You have um, investors, shareholders that you have to... Um, respond to, but then coming over to the Martino Center, um, mm -hmm. kind of figuring out also how you at the Wellman Center have navigated this and kind of how we can learn from you. But um, yeah, no, I, I I think that there it just takes kind of um, more of a concerted strategy around how to frame some of these innovations as well, because yes. um, I think it's easy to blame it on on money. Um, but I think if you would address it in the right way with a thoughtful strategy, you can get around those things. Yeah, well, what, what's that in that the big good book? It says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money. It's the love of money. <laughs> okay. So uh, anything more? This is kind of fun. Yes, sir. Hi, Rox. Hi, Connie Lilly. My name is Rick Cahaley. I've worked with you all on oh, agreements. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't. Hi, I don't. I, I don't have a legal question. I'm just curious, Lilla. You mentioned, if I heard correctly, targeting myelin for for pain. Yes. We're, we're as you know better than that. Myelin makes our nervous system go. And yes. So how 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 does that work? Yeah, very good question. So. Uh, myelin is a lipid-rich tissue. Uh, it has lipid content almost the same uh, percentage as fat tissue, which is what makes it selectively susceptible to cold. Um, so when we inject the eye slurry, we see the myelin gets disrupted. And when myelin gets disrupted around a peripheral nerve, the nerve kind of retracts, it loses the axons, but it's completely reversible. Uh, Within a course of, I would say, about two to three months, everything comes back to normal. Uh, so that's what makes this uh, attractive for targeting nerves in the periphery to, ta to reduce sensory function, for example. I mean, you could target motor nerves as well if they're playing any sort of pathologic role in the disease process. But um, by selectively disrupting the myelin temporarily and reversibly, you allow the nerve to not signal, um, but then it does come back to normal levels because you don't want it to be permanently gone. Uh, in the case of the fat, it's a permanent sort of targeted loss of the fat because the immune system comes in and clears out the fat cells that have died, and we know this, we've done experiments. So you're getting two different responses in two different tissue. Uh, but the technology itself is um, selectively targeting sort of the lipid-rich aspect of those tissues. Did, did she answer your question, Rick? Yeah, and I, and I you know, they told the body Yes. Yeah, I mean, we actually, we worried about that. There's all these demyelinating diseases, multiple sclerosis, probably the sine qua non of that one. And, and we just don't see any problem that actually these two collaborated Connor built a microscope that directly images lipids collaborated with Lilith and I so we can actually watch these processes and how does how does the injury occur what happens to the lipid how is it repaired and all those details and it kind of brings me I we're almost out of time but the, the the paying attention to mother nature here's this popsicle paniculitis thing um, 
then we developed fat loss, which was a big business. Now Lilit is turning that toward neurology, pain control, treatment of sleep apnea, that slide that she showed of where it's useful. But at the scientific root, what has happened is that the, the study of cold in medicine is at these extreme cold temperatures, liquid nitrogen, you know, dry ice that kill things. There's this intermediate range that just people somehow missed. Um, and we're having a lot of fun. It turns out melanocytes, for example, are, are sensitive to cold. We don't understand why. But in dermatology, and we're going to bring this back to treating some really horrible disorders of pigmentation, lifelong disfigurements that children face and so forth, that, you know, early stage research, but I can tell you it's going to work. I can already smell it, okay? So <laughs> anyway, um, there's a, a final slide here. Maybe? No, is this thing still working? This is for those of you who want to reach us. Um, I'm really bad with email, so I put my uh, secretary's office uh, number up there. If you, if you want to reach us, that's fine. Um, and uh, we would love to learn from you. So thank you for being here. Our session is over, but uh, it's been a, a great pleasure. I'll thank the organizers yeah. here at the end. There's Susan in the back, wave your hand. So this was all because Thanks, of her Susan. effort that we were able to get together. And I'll end also by thanking you for what you do. The diversity and the power in this room is impressive to me. We're actually a melting pot. So thanks again.